some of the worst predictions of all time. Roman engineer Julius Sextus Frontinus in AD 100 wrote, Inventions have long since reached their limit, and I see no hope for further developments. Journalist Junius Henry Brown in 1893 predicted, Law will be simplified over the next century. Lawyers will have diminished, and their fees will have been vastly curtailed. Computer scientist John von Neumann in 1949, 1949, boldly stated, it would appear we have reached the limits of what is possible to achieve with computer technology. And then Arthur Summerfield, U.S. Postmaster General under President Eisenhower in 1959 said, before man reaches the moon, your mail will be delivered within hours from New York to Australia by guided missiles. We stand on the threshold of rocket mail. Well, we may have rocket mortgages, but we don't have rocket mail. And then there's the, the vague and often erroneous predictions of Nostradamus, Edgar Case, Jean Dixon, other mediums and psychics and clairvoyant, uh, clairvoyance, along with, you know, the Quran and the Confucian Analects and similar religious writings, all of them put together are not anywhere near the same category as the prophecies of the Old and New Testament. Uh, unique among all books ever written, the Bible accurately foretells specific events in detail, not only many years, but oftentimes many centuries before they actually occur. There's approximately 2,500 prophecies that appear on the page of your Bible. 2,000 of them have already come to pass. They've already been fulfilled to the letter with no errors, and 500 or so remain uh, that reach into the future, and we may see them coming to pass in the days ahead. Uh, since the probability of any one of those prophecies having been fulfilled by chance averages less than 1 in 10, and that is very, very conservative. And since the prophecies are for the most part independent of one another, the odds, the odds for all of these prophecies having been fulfilled by chance without error is less than 1 in 10 to the 2,000th power. That's a, that's a, that, listen, that's a 1 with 2,000 zeros behind it. Only the Bible <laughs> manifests this remarkable prophetic evidence. And it does so in, uh, on such a tremendous scale as to render completely absurd any other explanation other than divine revelation. And I said all that to say this. If God has promised you something through his word, it shall come to pass. No matter how much the cards may be stacked against you, no matter how much the odds may be against you, no matter what man says, God has a history and you have the receipts. The Lord has an impeccable track record. He keeps his word. He fulfills his word. He is a faithful God. I want you to open your Bible today to Jeremiah chapter 31. As you're opening there, let me explain something that's highly theological in nature, but it is absolutely important to grasp in order to, to bring ancient prophecies to bear practically in our lives today because how many of you know the Bible has to relate to your life today? It has to be applied to your life today. The Word of God has to become your default setting when it comes to figuring things out. You know, when it, when it comes to problem solving, when it comes to making decisions, when it, you know, how to respond. The scripture, listen, it, it can't just be theoretical or theological. It's got to be practical. It, it is to be revered, but it is also of utmost relevance. It, it can't just be history. It's got to become your story. So how? How do ancient Biblical prophecies get translated into today's world. Here's how that works. 
If you're driving on a highway and you're approaching a significant mountain range, say you're approaching the Blue Ridge Mountains or you're approaching the Rockies or you're approaching the Alps, what will happen is as you approach, it will look like all of those mountains are close together. It'll look like one mountain is just behind the other, but they're not. You, you are more likely seeing mountains that are miles and miles apart, but from your vantage point, they look close together. Prophets in the Bible, they spoke to future events as if they were close together. Prophets in the Old Testament, they prophesied as if time was complete. It's why in the Bible, Daniel's 70 weeks are no less than 490 years. It's called the prophetic perspective. For instance, today in the chapter of Nehemiah, chapter 31, Jeremiah is going to quote a verse that appears three times in the Bible, three different places in the Bible. It's a verse that originated in Genesis where Rachel is weeping for her children. Why? Because she dies in childbirth. But then Jeremiah takes that same verse and he says, okay, that is also happening in my day. Rachel is weeping for her children. Why? Because children were separated from their mothers in the Babylonian exile. Jeremiah will say it's happening in my day. But when Matthew writes his gospel, he says, it is fulfilled at the birth of Jesus that Rachel is weeping for her children because Herod uh, committed the, the slaughter of the innocent. Three different times, three different places. Which one is accurate? Which one is true? The answer is yes. Same verse, true three times, separated by centuries. Listen, there's too much to cover in this chapter today, but I want you to know something, and maybe, you know, do homework and read this on your own time, but this chapter is fulfilled in Jesus, and it is clearly stated in verses 31 and 34 that we won't get to today, but it clearly states that it applies to those not only in Jeremiah's day, but more fully to those who live under the new covenant, so that means after the cross, and that means us. You see, our God is awesome like that. I said, our God is awesome like that. He speaks a word, and it is profoundly applicable on multidimensional levels. It is true across space and time. Why? Because God's truth is timeless. Say that with me today. God's truth is timeless. His word is forever settled in heaven. God's word does not return to him void, but it accomplishes the thing that he sends it out to do. There is no word of God that is void of the power to complete itself, and his truth endures to all generations. That's why God can say to Abraham, for instance, I will bless you and make you a blessing. I'll be your shield and your exceedingly great reward. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. He says it to Abraham, but he is saying it through Abraham to you. That's why when God says through Moses, I'll make you the head and not the tail, above only and never beneath, you'll lend to many and you'll borrow from none. It is a word for you. It's why when God says to Joshua, be strong and of a good courage, when he says to David, pursue, overtake, and recover all, it's why when God says to, a to Isaiah, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord, your God. I am the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Listen to me. When God says it to them, it's not just for them, it's for you. Have you found Jeremiah 31 yet? If you haven't quit now, go home and practice. Jeremiah chapter 31. Whew, we got a lot to cover here. We're going to start in verse 10. And I want you, as we study this together and as we read it together, you know, I, I want you to pray even right now in your heart. God, give me ears to hear. I want you to receive, because as I've gone over this so many times this week and just meditated on this chapter, I just feel like it is a very prophetic word for our world and for our church and for us as individuals. Receive this as a prophetic word today. Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 10. 
Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, or O peoples, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Stop right there for just a moment. Though God's people are scattered, he's still their shepherd. How many of you are glad that the Lord is your shepherd you shall not want? He makes you lie down in green pastures. He brings you to still and restful waters and he restores your soul. His rod and his staff, they comfort you. Yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll fear no evil. Why? Because he's with you. Because he's with you. You may be scattered, but he's your shepherd. He'll anoint your head with oil. He'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy so that your cup runs over. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. For the Lord has redeemed and ransomed. How many of you are glad that by the blood of Jesus, he paid the price for your ransom and he rescued you? Now check this out. He said he rescued you from one that is stronger than you. There have been things in your life that you could not have handled on your own, things that you could have not have overcome on your own. I know, I speak from experience. When I was 20 years old and I was a cocaine addict, no matter how hard I tried, I could not break free. It was stronger than me. But how many of you know, there's nothing and no one stronger than the Lord said, and I'll gather, and I'll ransom, and I'll buy back, and I'll redeem so that I can break them free from things they couldn't break free from on their own. Mm. Verse 12, therefore, <laughs> they shall come and sing in the height of Zion. Streaming to the goodness of the Lord. The Amplified Bible says they shall flow together and be radiant with joy. For wheat and new wine and oil, for the young of the flock and the herd, their souls shall be like a well-watered garden and they shall sorrow no more at all. Wow, what a promise. And Hebrews 12, 23. Because in Hebrews 12, 23, it says, we have come, but we have not come to Mount Sinai. We've not come to the law. We've not come to thundering and lightning. We've not come to where we're afraid to hear from God. We've not come to a place where we say, you know what? Don't speak to us. Speak to him. We haven't come to that mountain that even if somebody touches it, they die. So no, you haven't come to Mount Sinai. You've come to Zion. And Zion is a place where there's an innumerable number of angels, where there is the general and assembly and the church of the firstborn. Zion is the church of the firstborn where men were made perfect by God, where Jesus is the mediator of the new and better covenant, and where the blood of Jesus speaks that which is greater than that of Abel. I'm here to tell you that the Bible is saying there's coming a day where they will stream in to the house of the Lord. They'll stream in to the new covenant church, and I believe in Jesus' name, in the midst of all of this mess, when all of the dust settles, God is shaking everything that can be shaken so that when it's all done, that which is founded. How many of you know this needs to be a place of radiant joy? Do you know the word rejoice in your Bible in Hebrew? It means a number of things, but if you had to pick one word, do you know the word that we would pick in English? Party. See, there's a world out there that doesn't think of church. They don't think church uh, party. No, they think of church uh, boredom, church uh, irrelevance, church... Uh, no. And every time you look at it in the scripture, how many of you know when one person comes to the Lord, the angels throw a party? Still come streaming into the party. Mm. Because when they come in, it says here, 
They'll have wheat, new wine, and oil. They'll be watered. How many of you know when they come into the house of God that is a Bible-teaching, gospel-preaching, Christ-centered church, guess what happens? They're fed, and they drink in living water. And then watch this. Ready? And they shall sorrow no more at all. Why? How can that be possible? Here's exactly how that is possible. Because when you have Jesus, let me just say that again. And I said, when you have Jesus, when you have Jesus, you have everything you will ever need and more. And when you know that you have Jesus, it doesn't matter what you go through. Nothing on this planet and nothing underneath this planet can ever steal your joy. Verse 13, then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance and the young men and the old together and I will turn their mourning to joy. I will comfort them. That word comfort means to breathe. I will breathe on them and make them rejoice, which means to make merry. Rather than sorrow, I will satiate the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Mm. There's coming a day, and maybe today is your day, I said it last week, and I said it last week by the Spirit of God. There are some of us that have grieved for something for too long. There are some of us who have allowed there to be a cloud on our lives. We've got the great sadness. We've got a, a heaviness on us. But here you have a promise from a promise-keeping God that he will turn your mourning into joy. He will breathe on you. He will comfort you. Now watch this. Did you see it? He, he says, I'll satiate, which means to bathe Soak, ready? It means to make drunk. <laughs> drunk, the soul of the priest with abundance. Your King James Bible says there, with, I don't know about you, but I want the fatness. I said, I want the fatness. He said, I'll satiate the soul of the priest. Two applications. Certainly, he's talking about uh, 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 leadership. And I just want to tell you this. I don't know. I, I can speak for Pastor Elena and I. We're ready for, some, uh, for our souls to be satiated. We're ready for some joy in our souls. 2020 has not been an easy year for church leadership by any stretch of the imagination. There is no Bible college, no Bible school, no cemetery, excuse me, seminary on planet Earth that could teach you how to do 2020. It's been, listen, I've been in full-time vocational ministry since 1987. And there has never been a year this difficult to navigate. But we have a promise from God. I said, we have a promise from God. <laughs> I will satiate the soul of the priest with abundance. And by the way, not only is that speaking of church leadership, because in your New Testament, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6 that every single believer is a king and a priest unto their God. The Bible says we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm here to tell you today to get ready. Get ready. Get ready. We've been through a lot. I said, we have been through a lot, but we are coming out the other side stronger. We're coming out the other side better. We're coming out the other side with change that needs to happen. I'll satiate their soul. I'll satiate their mind, their will, and their emotions with fatness. And my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Verse 15, thus says the Lord. A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. That's the verse we talked about before. Appears in Genesis, appears in Jeremiah, and then is fulfilled in Matthew. Thus says the Lord, verse 16, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back 
from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. <laughs> this chapter is just jam-packed with hope. Your work shall be rewarded. Personalize it and say, my work shall be rewarded. Go ahead, say it with me. My work shall be rewarded. Say it again. My work shall be rewarded. Now, that's not necessarily talking about your career. It's not necessarily talking about where you work or your occupation. But there are some of us who have been working in the Lord for years. There are some of us who have been serving for years. There are some of us who've been working out what God has worked in by grace for years. And you've been praying for years. And you've been weeping for years. And you've been fasting and you've been studying and you've been believing God for years and I'm here to tell you, guess what? Ready? Your work will be rewarded. God is not forgetful. He remembers your labor of love that you have done in his name. So be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your work is never in vain in him. Somebody needs to say, I receive it. I receive it. Those of you who are prayer warriors and you've been praying for a decade, you've been praying for two decades, you've been praying for three decades, your work will be rewarded. Watch this. Ready? Because, I love verse 17, there is hope in your future. Oh, you need to say that one too and personalize that one. Ready? There is hope in my future. Say it louder. There is hope in my future. You need to say it one more time. There is hope in my future. Hope is always a confident expectation of good. You can expect the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You can expect the goodness of God to break in and break through your situation because your God is the God of hope. And specifically, what did he say here? What is the hope in the future for? Check it out in verse 16. And they shall come back. And then again at the second part of verse 17, that your children shall come back to their own border. If we did a survey today in this room of how many parents are believing God for their children and how many grandparents are believing God for their grandchildren to come back into the house of God, into a relationship with God. How many of us are trusting God that our prodigal children will come back to their father's house and here you have a promise from Almighty God that they shall come back. I speak it in the name of Jesus, your children... You train them up in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they shall not depart from it. We call them back today in Jesus' name. I said we call them back today in Jesus' name. We call them back from the land of the enemy. We call them back from secular ideologies. We call them back from doubt and unbelief. We call them back to Jesus. Verse 18, I have surely heard Ephraim. Let me say that again. I have surely heard Ephraim will come back, bemoaning himself. You have chastised me, and I, I, I was chastised like an untrained bull. Restore me. And I will return, for you are the Lord my God. Surely after my turning, I, I repented. And after I was instructed, I struck myself on the thigh. I was ashamed, yes, even humiliated, because I bore the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I might earnestly remember him still, therefore my heart yearns for him. I will have mercy on him, says the Lord. Oh my goodness, the keys in this passage. Ephraim. Do you remember who Ephraim was? 
Ephraim was the second son of Joseph. After God had restored Joseph, after he had become second in command in all of Egypt, after Pharaoh had changed his name to Zaphonath Paneah, his God hears. Listen, listen. After that, he had two children. He had, his first child was Manasseh. Manasseh meant God has made me forget. How many of you need some Manassehs in your life, right? There's some stuff that you just want to have some divine amnesia for. Manasseh. And the second son, his name is Ephraim. Ephraim, or Ephraim, means fruitful in affliction. God has made me forget, and yet he's made me fruitful even in affliction. He named his son fruitful in affliction. He said, you know what? Even when my brothers betrayed me, even when my brothers took my coat of many colors and dipped it in blood and told my father I was dead, even when I was in the pit, even when they sold me into slavery, even when I was falsely accused of rape and put in prison, even there God was working for me. He made me fruitful in my affliction because what they meant for evil, God meant for good. So, so, when he's reunited with his dad, when he's reunited with Jacob, he brings his sons before ancient Jacob, who can't even see anymore. And he says, Dad, bless my boys. And so he puts Manasseh, the firstborn, in front of the right hand of Jacob. Because the firstborn should have the double portion. The firstborn should have the place of authority. He should be, have the right hand laid on him. And he brings Ephraim before him on the left hand. And you know what Jacob does by the Spirit of God? Jacob goes. Joseph says, pop, no, no. And he tries to actually move his hands. And Jacob says, no. Because you want to know why? Because the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Listen to me carefully. All of a sudden, fruitful in affliction has now become the child of the double portion. The child of God's favor. Now that you know who Ephraim is, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself. If you drop down a few verses, he says, is, is, is Ephraim my dear son? Is, 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 is he a pleasant child? Those are rhetorical questions. The answer is absolutely he is. He's, 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 he's a pleasure to the heart of God. God's heart yearns after him. Why? Why? Because he says, you know what, Lord? You chastised me, and I received it. I made mistakes. I took some wrong turns. But if you restore me, it, 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 listen, it, it says here, he struck himself on the thigh. I made some mistakes. I've done some stupid things. Let me tell you right now, God will chastise you. God will correct you, but our God will never condemn you. Listen carefully. You may have done some stupid things, but that doesn't make you stupid. You may have done some foolish things, but that doesn't make you a fool. Are you hearing me? I was ashamed, he says. Even humiliated my family, there's a good thing about guilt. Listen, if you feel no guilt after you've done something wrong, you better check your heart. God uses it. Godly sorrow produces repentance, the Bible says. When you do the wrong thing, you ought to feel guilty. Now, you ought not to stay guilty, but you ought to feel guilty. And you need to let Holy Ghost guilt lead you to the foot of the cross where you say, you know what? After I turned and I walked away, I repented. He didn't deflect. He didn't blame shift. He owned his wrong. And he said, Lord, I repent before you. God says, therefore, <laughs> my heart yearns for him. Do you know what? This is what we see in David as well. David writes, you know what? A contrite spirit he will not turn away from. And God says, David is a man after my own heart. He may have made some mistakes, but he owned it and he repented. Ephraim may have made some mistakes, but he owned it and he repented. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. 
Okay, for the sake of time, you got to skip down to verse 27. This is the verse I've been waiting to get to. Actually, the next two verses. In this incredible chapter that is fulfilled in Jesus, that if you just go a little bit further down in the chapter, you know this is for new covenant people. In verse 27, God says this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will sow. That I will sow. The Bible is full, as we saw during offering time, the Bible is full of instruction for what we should sow. Here God says, I will sow. How many of you know when God sows, God reaps a harvest? That I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. He's saying when I restore, I not only restore, I multiply. I'm going to multiply your children. I'm going to sow man. Your families are going to increase. Your house is going to increase. Your clan is going to increase. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to see the family of God increase. I'll sow to man and to beast. What is God saying there? I'll also sow livestock. How many of you know back in ancient times, there was not necessarily the money, but you traded in agriculture and livestock. But you know what was worth more? Livestock. How many of you know cattle's worth more than corn? I should say that with a West Texas accent right there. How many of you all know that cattle's more than corn? He said, I will sow and I will multiply you and I'll multiply with abundance what you have. And then here it is, ready? Verse 28. And it shall come to pass. Say it with me. And it shall come to pass. Say it again. And it shall come to pass. Watch this. That as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break, and to plant, says the Lord. I'm going to read that again. And it shall come to pass. How many of you know when God says it's going to come to pass, it's going to come to pass. It'll be. It'll manifest. It'll become a reality in your lives. It shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck. The word pluck there means to tear away, to pull out by the roots. As I have watched over them to break down. That means to overthrow. To throw down, which means to beat down into pieces, and to destroy, which means to make utterly void, and to afflict, which means to punish and make good for nothing, so I will. As I have, I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. There have been things in your life that came to nothing. There have been things in your life that came to utter destruction. Things that you couldn't understand in the moment why they were taken away. Why they were pulled up from the roots. There may have been a job that you had that you lost and you don't know why. There may have been a relationship. People that have been pulled up out of your life. And you said, why did that happen? I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me why that doesn't happen anymore, why I don't have that relationship, why that person's not in my life anymore. And I am here to tell you today that the reason why those things were pulled up and plucked up and broken into pieces is because God was watching over you. God was watching, listen to me, there is nothing that takes place in your life that doesn't come under the sovereign rule of God. There is nothing in your life, just like Joseph could say, you know what, God made me fruitful in affliction because what people meant for evil, God meant for good. I'm here to tell you today that when things were being destroyed in your life, God was there. Where was God in that moment? He was right there. And he was orchestrating it. Are you ready? Listen to me carefully. There are people that are not in your life today. You want to know why? Because you can't build with certain people in your life. 
He said, I destroyed, I pulled out. I took them out of your life because I want to build in your life. I want to plant new crops in your life. I want you to have a new harvest. I'm doing a new thing in your life, but I can't build and I can't plant with certain people in your life. So I remove them. Listen carefully. There are people who are no longer in your life. And that doesn't make them bad people necessarily. There are some people who are not in your life right now and God removed them from your life because you can't build with them. There are some good people you can't build with. If there are quitters, campers, and climbers, you can only build with climbers. You can't build with quitters in your life. You can't build with people who will bail on you when it matters most. You can't build with campers in your life, complacent people. People who say, well, you know, isn't this good enough? You know, can't we just stay right here? Isn't this good? I don't want to go to a higher altitude. I'm tired. I just... you, you, can't, you can't necessarily build with people who are too phlegmatic in their souls. If there are quitters, campers, and climbers, you can only build with climbers. And when Jesus talked about sowing the word of God into people's hearts, do you know what he said? He says there's four kinds of human hearts, just four kinds of human, just four. There's wayside. There's stony ground. There's thorny ground. And there's good ground. And I'm sure that's not divided into 25%, but if it was, that means only one type of human heart can God build with. It is the heart that is fertile soil for the seed of the Word of God. It is the heart that will hear the Word of God and do it. And my family, those are the people you need in your life to build, to go where God wants you to go, to reap the harvest in your life that God wants you to reap because He's about to build and He's about to plant. And just as He was there, when times were hard and just as he was there when it didn't make sense and just as he was there when your heart was broken and just as he was there when you were in exile when you were captive to things that were too hard for you to break through just as he was there then he will be there when you take the next step forward and the next step forward and the next step forward he will be there when what you sow begins to grow no, he'll be there when your work is rewarded. God is doing a new thing in your life. And just as he's been there all along, he will watch over your life to make sure it happens. It shall come to pass. 